All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started um, as people are joining us so we can get to the real reason why everyone is here tonight. My name is Sophia Zanowski. I'm the coordinator of development registrar and assistant to the Dean at St. Bernard's. It is a uh, pleasure to be here tonight. We haven't had a Words of the Wine since November, so this is the first one of 2021, um, and it is great to be back, that is for sure. Uh, before we dive into um, the discussion for tonight, I do just kind of want to give a brief introduction, who we are, what we do, um, and kind of how the night will go. So in my job as registrar, I do a lot of classroom tech support. So we ask that you just mute yourselves um, during the lecture, unless you know, you're speaking or participating in Q&A. And also if you run into any technical difficulties, I will be monitoring the chat box. So you can just feel free to put something in there and I will try to help you as best as I can. Um, in my job as coordinator of development, I did wanna thank anyone who donated at the time of registration. Of course, that was very optional, but we are grateful nonetheless, um, as we continue to weather these very interesting, interesting times. Um, and I do want to, for anyone who is unfamiliar with St. Bernard's, I want to give you an introduction about um, who we are. So we are a graduate school located in upstate New York in Rochester, although we have campuses across uh, the upstate New York region, and then we serve students from all over the country. We have a couple of master's degrees, our newest one being a master of arts and Catholic philosophy, one of the only uh, um, ones of its kind in the country. So that's very exciting. That's where we see a lot of our national students joining us in our online um, distance education program. We also have quite a few certificate programs, which we just launched this past fall, where you can take our graduate courses uh, but you don't need to have a bachelor's degree. You don't need to commit to a full master's degree. One of our certificates is actually a certificate in Catholicism um, and the fine arts, which is very relevant to people who enjoy this series, Words with Wine. So I love to give a plug for that. Um, but because we also, we don't just focus on information, we really focus on formation. So we love to do a lot of things outside of our classroom, even though right now our classrooms are virtual, um, like these events. So we have this Words with Wine series every third Thursday of the month. And then we also offer a series called Theology and Culture, which focuses on um, topics relevant to our current climate, our current culture that happens every first Thursday of the month. So um, we invite you to check out us on Facebook if this is your first time hearing about us to look at some of our upcoming event offerings. We have one coming up on February 4th about sex trafficking and feminism and human um, women with poverty. So we have some really, really unique offerings that I actually find very enjoyable. This is one of my favorite parts of my job. Now, um, we partner with this event series with a vineyard out in California called uh, New Clairvaux. So our namesake is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a Trappist Cistercian monk in the 11th century. And if you know anything about Trappist communities, which are located all over the country and the world, they devote themselves to a life of prayer and labor. Many of these communities live out their mission of prayer and labor by focusing on producing a product and a very, very high standard of whatever product they choose. In this case, um, the product is wine at this vineyard. So this, these, this community of monks partners with a local winemaking, generations long winemaking family to produce mostly white wines um, out in California. So we decided to partner with them in March, right at the height of when the pandemic was starting to um, bring people together from across the country. I mean, literally coast to coast, New York to California and talk about our favorite things. Faith, fine arts, and of course, over a glass of wine. Um, they can't be here tonight to talk about them, but they do have this wonderful video that I will send you in a follow-up um, a follow-up email that just kind of goes over who they are, what they do, talks about their mission, which we share in, not just our names, but we also share in their mission. So we really love partnering with them over the past almost year of doing this event series. And we've, we've run the gamut, I think, of genres in terms of visual arts, music, um, drama, to, like tonight. So this has been really, really wonderful to be able to partner with them. Now, I do want to just give a introduction of our speaker, Apollonio Latar III. Apollonio is one of our oh. professors, and he taught a course called The Whole Breath of Reason last semester for us, which focused on science, technology, and faith. It was really, really dynamic, really wonderful. And so we are so excited to have him back to um, give this event tonight. 
Apollonio received his master's in education at Marymount University. He also studied philosophy at Rutgers and sacred theology um, in Rome. He's currently the theology department chair at St. Paul VI Catholic High School. His interests include the theology of Joseph Ratzinger and Balthazar, as well as metaphysics, analytical philosophy, scripture, and fundamental theology. So without further ado, I'm going to, going to go ahead and turn it over to him. All right, guys. Um, hello. Uh, nice to see familiar faces. Um, also former students um, and people from Communal Liberation and new faces. Um, I hope if you're, you know, of the age, you're, you have like a glass of wine. I have a Brunel di Montalcino, which is, I think, the favorite drink, drink of the Holy Trinity, I think, but that's just me. Um, and I wanted to, before we talk about Miguel Manara, um, and the reason why we're, we're um, going over Miguel Manara is because it's one of the fundamental texts of uh, Luigi Dusani, which inspired the charism of communal liberation. So communal liberation is a charism in the Catholic Church, an ecclesial movement. It's pretty much um, a friendship, a sharing of one's life, so that we can always be reminded that we're loved by Christ, and then we share this love with each, with, for the whole world. And um, so I know um, some of you, um, or a lot of you, don't know uh, Luigi Giussani uh, too well. So I would like to uh, present a little bit who he is and what the charism is before we go uh, go and talk about Miguel Mignotta. And um, for me personally, um, I think I, I owe a lot to, to Luigi Giussani, um, probably everything in the sense of my teaching and the way I look at life right now. Um, he helped me look at my family, my friends, my studies, my work in a different way. Um, he helped me love again what I once loved but forgotten um, and embrace everything. And again, um, I met uh, people from the charism when I was in college in Rutgers. Um, I met uh, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, whose book I would like to advertise also. Yes, new book, The Relevance um, of the Stars. And we'll talk about the relevance of the stars a little bit later on. Lorenzo Albacete was a great man, a great priest, great theologian. And I, we had a lot of conversations with each other in Rutgers. Um, I was also influenced by the missionaries of St. Charles Borromeo, um, especially the founder, um, Don Massimo Kamizaska, who is now a bishop. And particularly also Father Antonio Lopez, who is now the Dean of John Paul Institute in, at DC. And pretty much, I think everything I'll say today, it's either, you know, I, I probably got it from him somehow um, and anything bad, it's from me, right? Um, and I think, and especially, um, there's also um, a good friend of mine who uh, I also met in the charism, her name is Martina, um, who was, who's a great historian of, um, the, of the Middle Ages, probably the best historian of the Middle Ages today, I think. Um, and there's also um, a friend of mine who's actually here, Alexi Noel. If you you know look around, she's right there. And I didn't you know I want to embarrass her, but she was there in Rutgers. And uh, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't uh, have known Giussani. So why is Giussani, Monsignor Luigi Giussani, relevant at all? Why do we need to even hear about him? And why is he important? Um, now. This charism, this movement is all over the world. There's charitable organizations, there are cultural events. Um, so it has a lot to offer to the world, but what else can we learn from him? I think the best way to um, answer this question is to ask another question, which a lot of Catholics today take for granted. Um, a lot of Catholics in the church today, you know, ask how can we reach people? Do we use social media? Do we uh, use podcasts or whatever? How do we reach people today? Um, but nobody really asked this question. This question is the most fundamental one, which is this. Do we still have something to say to the world today? What else do we have to say? I mean, I think it's, you know, before we think about how we can reach people, we have to ask ourselves, is there something important that the world is missing? Because there's technological prog progress, there's science, um, and a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, uh, especially in Catholic schools, for maybe, 
um, they will reduce Christianity to simply morals, right? We, we need to change behavior. If we're, we can show that we need to be kind, moral, right, forgiving, all that stuff. But the thing is, you can be a good Hindu, right? You can be a good person when you're a Hindu. You can be a good atheist. I know a lot of good people who are atheists, Hindus, Muslims, and so on. So then what is it that Christianity has to offer today? Or what Balthazar asked, what is Christian about Christianity? And I think what is great about Dusani is that he gets to the essence of Christianity. What is Christianity? He tries to answer that question. And Christianity can't simply be a repetition of doctrine or being moral, which is to say you change your behavior, right? You're a good person. It has to be something deeper. It has to reach our affection. And I think this is where Yusani is great is because we, we are missing affection today. What is our affection grounded in? And when we don't have affection, we can't imagine the other. And if we can't imagine the other, we're violent towards the other. We're violent to ourselves and to each other because we lack affection. So Christianity has something to do with our affection. If it doesn't, then to me, uh, I might as well be something else, right? Um, and that's why I think he was really great. I mean, Yusani had passion for humanity. He had passion for humanity. And we'll, now I'll, I would like to share my screen to talk a little bit about uh, Yusani for a little bit. So yeah, we'll talk a little bit about Yusani for a little bit. Um, I'm trying to give myself maybe 10 minutes um, and then we'll talk about Miguel Manata, right? Um, because I can talk about your sign the whole time. So, um, and if you're getting bored, just tell me. So, um, all right, PowerPoint. I haven't used PowerPoint in a long time. As Dwight Schrute said, PowerPoint is boring. So I rarely use it, but I think this is good for Zoom. Um, in the words of um, Ratzinger, um, Yusani was wounded by beauty. Um, something beautiful was being born in 1956 to 1965 in Berche Classical School in Milan with this young priest. And that was even before Vatican II, right? Um, but it started in 1954 in a train. It was on a train. Yusani was on a train, this Italian priest. And he was speaking to college students. And when he was speaking to college students, he learned that they had no idea what Christianity was. Now, they went to mass, right? They might not have known some doctrine, they could re repeat what the catechism said, right, of, of that time, but there was no fire there. And Jusani knew that. Now, he was a seminary professor at that time, and instead of, um, instead of um, staying as a, a professor, he thought, I need to go to high school. I need to go to high school and teach students um, to have passion, to have this fire, to, to propose to them that Christianity is worth living. And then because he saw that for them, they might go to mass, right? They might pray at night, but it's during their daily lives, as, it's as if God didn't matter to them. He was irrelevant. And he said this, and this was his method um, in the high school. He said, I'm not here so that you take my ideas as your own. I'm here to teach you a true method that you can use to judge the things I will tell you. And what I have to tell you is the result of a long experience of a past that is 2000 years old. And his method was to show how faith could be relevant to life's needs. And he says, as a result of the education I received at home, my seminary training, and my reflections later in life, I came to believe deeply that only a faith arising from the experience of life and confirmed by it could be sufficiently strong to survive in a world where everything pointed in the opposite direction. Sufficiently strong to survive in a world where everything pointed in the opposite di direction. So the first thing to point out with Jasani is that he's first and firm foremost an educator, not a philosopher or a theologian, but an educator. And an educator is someone who imparts a love, who communicates a life, who, who proposes uh, the meaning of life. 
And so that's where uh, his, uh, we could say his, this ecclesial movement started in, in the high school. And he started with like four people and from four people on, it grew. Now, so what is it? So what's the method of Dusani? I would like to start with this um, picture um, from Van Gogh. You can see the beautiful stars, beautiful uh, colors and everything, the horizon. And what makes this meaningful are these two people. And this picture was given to me by my friend Martina and my friend Alexi when I was in Rutgers and I always kept it and it, it struck me because um, what this picture shows is that the meaning of the stars, the meaning of the scene makes sense. And it's related to the meaning of these couple, the love between this man and woman. And, and I, would, I love this story, and I'll share this story. One of my favorite stories is this, that one night, Giussani was um, riding his bike. I think it was in Lazio, it's in Italy, it's nearby Rome. And he saw a couple, a young college people, making out. And he was riding his bike and they saw two couples making, about to make out. And they saw this priest with his cassock riding a bike and they stopped, right? And Johnny said, if, if you weren't doing anything wrong, why did you stop, right? And then he, he kept on, he drove again. He, he kept riding his bike. And then he looked at the stars and he said, it's the, the most beautiful idea he had ever had in his entire life. It came to him at that moment. What did he do? He went back to the couple making out and he saw them, they were about to make out again. He went to them and he asked them, what does this have to do with the stars? And he said this, I had discovered what morality is, what man's dignity is, what the value of even the smallest action is. No human moment can be empty Every instant is like a detail of a huge painting, something missing. We do not carry out any act that is not connected to everything. Morality is to carry out an act that serves everything. So the beautiful thing about this story is that he went up to these couple, not to you know say, look, you're horrible. What are you doing? You're making out, right? He wasn't a moralistic in that way. What he did was he showed them a path. Look at the stars, look at what's in front of you. Because for him, and this is what defined Giussani, Giussani had passion, he wanted, he desired everything. Everything that we do has meaning in relationship to the whole meaning of the whole cosmos. Um, and for him, he wanted a fuller and truer possession of everything. And this, and this is where we come to is the original, an original category that he made up pretty much. And this category is the word experience. Now for Gisani, a lot of people, now the word, he used the word experience a lot. He says, Christianity must be experienced. Now, when we use the word experience, we usually think of something subjective, like a feeling, right? And back then, before Vatican II, the word experience was very, you know, it was People had suspicious, uh, suspicion about it because they thought you're either a Protestant or you're a modernist. Because if you speak about experience, you're reducing Christianity to your feelings. But for Gisani, experience was not totally subjective. Experience was reality emerging in our consciousness. Reality emerging in our consciousness. Now, what is reality according to Gisani? So in other words, there's something objective about experience. It's reality. Now, what is reality? Reality is a gift. It has a gift and meaning. It is therefore a presence. In other words, it's a sign. And to experience something is to understand the meaning of what's in front of me and, and what relates to the meaning of everything. So the meaning of the stars has to do with the meaning of these couple. And these two has to do with the meaning of the whole cosmos. So you can't really have experience unless you understand the meaning of something. 
So if you hear a music, yeah, you can hear the sound and so on, but that's not an experience. It's an experience when you understand the meaning of that music. That's when it becomes an experience. It's, um, I'm reminded by, um, for me, one of my favorite stories is Dante, right? And I think uh, uh, Professor Marco Stango from St. Bernard's and I were talking about this a couple of months ago. I mean, Dante is great. And, you know, and if you want to read about Dante, what, what he was like, read Balthazar's uh, Glory of the Lord, Volume 3, where um, it's the first time in history, Balthazar says, where a man wanted to know what it meant to love a woman. Not to love God in this woman, but to love a woman. What does it mean for me to love a woman, right? And for Dante, he, the only way he can really love this woman, Beatrice, was to go through all of history, right? He went on a journey, a path, which is, no, Inferno, which is hell, right? Purgatorio, and then Paradiso, where only within the context of the whole picture of the cosmos, that he understood what it meant to love Beatrice. It was to, to love Beatrice was to love the whole cosmos. And that for Giussani, what experience is, the whole person in front of me, the meaning of this person is related to the whole cosmos. In other words, for him, experience is Catholic. And Catholic means in the Greek word, it means according to the whole, right? According to the whole person in relationship with the whole cosmos. Now, what does reality do? Reality is a sign again, right? What reality does, it shows, it. Um, it provokes our freedom. Reality for Gisani is more beautiful than our own ideas. It precedes and exceeds our desires. So how does it do that? How does reality precede and exceeds our desires? By wounding it. It provokes our desires. And, the, and what does reality reveal? It reveals this, two things. First, that we desire the infinite. By looking at a rose, a flower, it provokes something. It makes me desire the infinite, even if I don't know it. And second, it reveals our incapacity to reach it. I mean, this picture of um, you know, by Matisse, right, of Icarus is great because that red dot, right, that part is what defines him, right? Um, but this means that there's a disproportion between what I want and what I can do. There's always a disproportion between what I want and what I can do, right? Maybe I want things to be better with my family, my studies. And especially today, it's, it's really hard for us to, to um, embrace this fact because we think that we have to control everything, right? We have to control everything. We have to know our vocation right away, uh, do the right thing. But for Gisani, he saw that our desires are always greater than what we can do. That reality is better than our ideas of our own fulfillment. Because our ideas of the world, our ideas of our fulfillment are too small, right? So reason for Gisani, the human heart, right? Reason is the capacity to wonder, which is to know, which is to know all of reality in all of its factors. Now, there's something that happened in history that provoked this needs, the needs for the infinite, the needs to embrace the meaning of everything. And this was Christ. Um, this is a beautiful painting. Um, here we see Jesus, right? Pointing like, no, like that hand is like uh, Michelangelo's um, hand. He's recreating Matthew and there's this light, right? Coming um, behind Jesus. So Jesus is the sacrament. Right, um, and Yusani uses he speaks about an exceptional encounter. An exceptional encounter is when I meet someone who corresponds to the deepest desires of my heart. That's what an exceptional encounter was, and for the apostles in the first century, I mean, this was an interesting question: How would the apostles know that Jesus was God? Right, he didn't have the word God on his forehead. How would they know? that this man was God. And why would they follow him? Why would they leave everything to follow this man? It was simple because he corresponded to the deepest desires of their heart. This man answered the depth 
of their desires. And he awakened the depth of their desires. He made them more hungry for the truth, more hungry for beauty. Um, one of the most beautiful insights I had um, to understand the exceptional encounter is actually, um, I was at um, Five Guys, which is a great fast food restaurant. And I was um, getting um, a double bacon cheeseburger because that's the only thing you should really order in Five Guys. And I remember just one, one day I was there, um, I ordered the double bacon cheeseburger. I sat down with my friends and I took one bite of that cheeseburger. And that experience was like, this is awesome, right? And then the experience was also, I did not know I was this hungry. That's what it was like to meet Christ. It, it fulfilled their desires and made them hungry at the same time. And they did not know that they wanted Christ. They could not have foreseen this, uh, this encounter. It just happened. And for Jisani, this encounter has to happen today in human beings, in the human flesh. And in fact, um, Yusani uh, used to meet with Joseph Ratzinger a lot to, you know, ask him, you know, am I saying the right things? Can you help me out? Am I, am I orthodox? Am I a heretic? Right. And um, what, one of the points that Yusani wanted to make was that it is through the flesh that God speaks to us. And then Ratzinger said, yeah, that's awesome. Right. And that's important today because what happens is that when I meet someone, a human presence that is exceptional, this presence is a sign, and this presence is a sign which makes me want to know more. In other words, it leads me to verify what I have encountered, and this is really important for Dusani, what it means to educate. To educate means to propose a way of life, the meaning of life, and then I have to verify this in my experience. Is this true? Like, for example, a priest might tell me, you know what? If you say morning prayer, you'll have a be more beautiful life. Then I have to see, is this true? And this is important because once I verify, once I verify this truth, then there's nothing that can happen to me that will take away the certainty. Even if that priest or that person committed the worst sins in the world. And that's important because today we don't trust authority, right? But for Jisani, once you verify an experience over and over again, you gain certainty. And so, for example, this priest could be, I could find out that this priest abused children. Does that mean that I have to doubt what he said to me? No. Why? Because I have verified this on my own. I have reasons to tell the world this is true. Not simply because this priest said it but I have verified it in my own experience. And that is how uh, the incarnation continues in the church today. Now, obviously, um, the, the, the church is the sign of Christ. And one of the temptations in life is to get rid of the sign of Christ, right? Either we think Christ is this person in front of me and therefore it's idolatry, or I don't need this person, this hum human person in front of me. I can just love Christ, right? I can just have an image of the divine mercy of St. Faustina, and I'm good. But your sign says, nope, you need the sign. You need the church. You need a human face. Now, this face is, this human face is a sign of Christ who can never be reduced to an experience or a feeling. There's an absolute singularity of Christ. And this this uh, picture, by the way, by um, Dante, um, that Giussani always taught about virginity. I think it's one of the best uh, things he, 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 he brought to the church, this understanding of virginity. Now, this, what is virginity according to Giussani? Virginity, by the way, is the vocation of everyone. Virginity is to love everything in their truth. That's what virginity is. So everyone is called to virginity. Even married people are called to virginity. It is to possess in detachment. In other words, I cannot love a person if I'm too close to that person, right? If I manipulate that person, if I project my own ideas to this person, 
I can only love a person when I understand that the other person is a gift. When I can only love the, when I can love the giver in the gift. Like for example, if a girl, you know, sees a rose on the table, right? The way to love the rose is to love the one who gave her the rose, right? She, she loves the rose more because she knows who gave her the rose. Now this picture is really, really beautiful because here's Christ, right? After the resurrection, Mary Magdalene wanted to grab on to him. Actually, the Greek word means he want, he, she wanted to hold on to him. And then Jesus says, do not hold on to me because I have to go to the Father, right? There's this distance. He needed to ascend to the Father. Well, what happened when he ascended to the Father? He gave the world the Holy Spirit. And what, what does the Holy Spirit do? He, he makes us recognize Christ. And he brings about the Eucharist. So it was only when Jesus distance himself from Mary Magdalene, that he can communicate himself in the Eucharist where Mary Magdalene could touch him, can finally be one with him. So it's being one with the other in their truth and in distance. So we cannot love somebody if we grab onto them. We can only love a person in detachment, in within a distance. And, and one another example is the widow of Nain. Right? Here's a mother who lost her child, who lost her husband before. And Thomas Aquinas said that um, there's a very beautiful question in Summa Theologia. Um, I don't remember where it is, but um, it's there. Um, Thomas Aquinas asked, is it better to be loved or to love? And he said, it's better to love because a mother's love is the greatest and she always loves, right? She always gives herself. But here, the widow of Nain is really interesting because the mother's love cannot even save her son from death. And you cannot love a person unless you can tell to the other, as Gabrielle Marcel said, you will never die. And Christ came and she, he said to her, do not weep. In other words, this, and then he, of course, he raised uh, her son from the dead. In other words, only in Christ can this widow be a mother again. It's only in Christ that we can only be a mother, a father, a husband, and a wife. That's what virginity is, this profound love, because Christ saves what we love most. And finally, um, this beautiful uh, picture on the left, um, after the resurrection, um, one of the most beautiful passages that Yusani ever meditated on. Here's Jesus, he went up to Peter, and instead of saying, you're an idiot, or are you sorry? He said, do you love me? And Peter said, I don't know how I, know, how I do, but I do love you, right? So in the end, um, uh, we are not defined by our sins, not defined by our mistakes. In fact, those mistakes and sins lead us to the face of Christ that allows us to say, yes, I do love you. So at this moment, we can say, I am yours. For Jusani, it was always about beginning again. Can we begin again? And even if we sin so many times, just you know, yesterday or two hours ago, we can always begin at this moment. Um, and, and again, I, um, I love this photo of, on the right of uh, Luigi Jusani and um, you know, before he was dying, um, now he suffered a lot. He was suffering from Parkinson's. Uh, he was persecuted in the church. But, you know, in his deathbed, he said, uh, reality never betrayed me. Reality never betrays. And because it's, it's greater than what we can conceive. Um, so once a person meets Christ, um, everything changes. Like in front of beauty, in front of the face of Christ, uh, you must change your life. Okay, um, so that was a very, very quick um, introduction, very, very quick introduction to um, Luigi Gisani. And um, on that, I think it's, um, I think it would be good for us to read Miguel Mignar in that way. Hopefully that actually shows um, how there are a lot of concepts that you can see now, you know, if, if you guys read uh, Miguel Mignar. Uh, now, if you haven't read Miguel Mañar, I know some of you guys didn't. You guys just came here for the drink, or you're drinking to look at me and everybody else, which is fine. I wouldn't have 
read the text either. But um, what I would like to, um, instead of me lecturing about Miguel Munar, I would also like to see for those who, who, who read this, you know, if they can see any correlation between what I said really quickly and the text. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think today, uh, Sophia, can they just unmute and talk? Or if yeah. not, I mean, I'm gonna talk the whole time. You don't want me to talk the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, if you if people can unmute if they have thoughts, yeah. Okay. Uh, wait, let me just okay. Let, let me just actually introduce. I mean, for those who haven't read it, um, which is fine. Again, um, it's more or less this. There was a man named Miguel Manara. He was a womanizer, uh, a very horrible sinner, um, but he was bored with life. He saw that having fun doesn't make life meaningful, and he was bored until uh, somebody told him to go meet. Um, Girolama, I'm gonna say Girolama. I don't know how to pronounce this. I'll say it in American English, Girolama. Um, and this woman, who by the way, I mean, if, for all those men out there, I mean, if you read Girolama, you have to have a crush on her, right? I mean, she's amazing. Um, and then um, it was this encounter with Girolama that um, his life changed. And his life changed and he met Christ. And two, two three months later, uh, Girolama dies, and then he enters uh, the monastery afterwards. So that's more or less the story. Um, but if you guys have any insights or anything, that'd be cool. Um, I have one. Um, so reading the uh, text, you see that talking again, he's a womanizer. And you see that in all these women, I, he's trying to find a new piece of himself, a piece that he's lost. And then he's, that's why he's looking for, he's bored with life because he thinks in these women, he's going to find something new and beautiful in his life. And yet he still is not able to obtain that. And we often looking at this and going to GS before, and now still coming back to CL. We always talked about the infinite desire. We look for signs to find our way to the infinite. And as you talked about before, no matter all of our sins, they lead us back to the face of Christ. And in that moment, going to meet the, um, I can't remember her name, but the woman he meets that changes his life, she helped guide him back to Christ. And then we get the beautiful scene where he falls on his knees at the monastery, begging for his life to change, to be, to be born again, to be new, to live a life faithful and devout to Christ. So the women, in the inside in that, the women were almost... Look, he was looking for a new piece of himself in these women that was only be able to found in Christ and the life with Christ. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Hi, hi, Apollonio, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody from the House of Formation in Albany. Um, I have a question um, for you, or yeah, a question, a request to say something more about the, the concept of desire. Because on page uh, eight of the play, uh, Miguel Magnara talking about uh, his experience, and Giussani in his reading of the Miguel Magnara uh, says that this is the first time uh, Miguel Magnara is in gets in touch with his own self, with his own I. And I always thought that this is the key line of the entire passage. So he says, Miguel Magnara, for the desire is always there. He's saying, you know, there's something wrong in my life. I don't like you guys anymore. Um, there's, and the, he explains this in these terms, for the desire is always there, stronger and madder than ever. It is like a fire in the sea that blasts its flame into the deep universal black emptiness. And, and I, I'd, like, I'd like to hear more from you, if you could help us understand better this notion of desire. Uh, I, I, I know that this is crucial for Dusani, and I think that um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. If you could help us understand better this notion of desire. Um, so, unless anybody wants to answer first, I know the answer, 
But if anybody wants to answer first, I <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, um, no, I think it's um, all right. A couple things. It's really interesting because I said that reality provokes our desire, um, and it's now the way I read Jusani is it's very much like um, what Thomas Aquinas said about the passions of love, which is first there's an affection, right? And then the reality affects you and then you desire something, um, right? I see a watch and I, I want it, right? But there's an affection, affectus, right, first. And I think what happened is this, even, and it's really interesting because reality for Jusani says it never betrayed me. And even in, when it comes to the reality of one's sins. So here's Miguel Manyara, who, um, was a womanizer. And it's really interesting because, you know, it, um, in page six, for example, I mean, they were saying like, how many, how many people have you slept with, right? How many, seven, nine, blah, 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 right? And then, and it's interesting because uh, Don Miguel Manara, he always, um, yeah, he, he, he went after women, uh, he, he committed crimes and so on. And yet that reality of even the sin even uh, made him recognize his desire more. Um, and, and it's really interesting because um, what the desire shows him is that he's bored, right? I mean, he's actually bored. It's, it's not like saying, I'm wrong. Look at me, I'm, I committed a sin or I'm, I'm immoral. The question of morality of what's right and wrong wasn't even there in Miguel Manara. He went to the root of the problem, which is I'm bored. Right? What's the meaning of this? And so for Jusani, I think desire for him is always a question. It's a need, of the, the needs of the heart is a question. And if it's not a question, it's somehow we think we reduce the answer to our own con concepts and ideas. Um, and it's really interesting because he says, what, what you said, be, the line before he said, how do I fill up this emptiness in life? What can I do? It's really beautiful because that's it, that is our experience today, right? We think we can control everything. And yet there is still that, that something, this sadness. And for Jisani, sadness is a good thing. So there, there is, a, because sadness tells us that we want something more. There's an absence of good. Um, so even this reality of our sins, it wakes us up in some ways. And, um, and only by getting to the root of this question, how do I fill up this emptiness in life? Because usually when we are bored, we try to do something about it. We create new things, right? I'm bored. All right, let's create a new hobby, right? But there's always that desire. It's always there. We wouldn't create a new hobby if the desire wasn't there, right? Um, now, it's interesting because boredom is the perception that reality is dull. We have to create our own meaning. It doesn't speak to me. And so we just you know, try to create our own meaning and own happiness and so on. But for Jisani, he is, I mean, what's beautiful about this, and then um, it's interesting because he said there is that desire for infinite, uh, there's a desire to embrace the infinite possibilities. And then that's where Don Fernando comes in, right? Don Fernando comes in and he pretty much says, I remember your father. And he used the image of the father, right? And in other words, um, Don Fernando was betting on his heart. He trusted in his heart and to go out and to the church and meet Girolama and so on. But I think for Jisani, this desire is always already there. Um, and it's very much, um, you know, like Aquinas says, you know, um, we, in everything that we know, uh, we, implicit, we implicitly know God in whatever we know, or we love God implicitly in whatever we love. And I think that's where uh, Jisani gets the concept of desire from. And for me, again, I do think that even the reality of sin provokes a question in us, which is to say, why am I, why does this make me lonely? And there is a desire there already. And, and what I, what's great about Jusani is that when he says reality never betrays me, even sin has a place. 
in 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 real because sin is real it's not a you know it's not a substance or anything but it's real and it does provoke something in us it reminds us what we really want and that what we really want is really there now our desires for jisani is infallible our criteria is infallible our needs for truth justice love and beauty it's infallible but we all, we always misinterpret them right um I'm not sure. Does that uh, answer the question, Mark? That's a little. I went around and around and around, but no, it, it does. Yeah, it absolutely does. Thank you. Hi, this is Annie. I want to make a comment. Um, I thought Don Fernando was crucial. Crucial. I don't think he would even have noticed Jerolima if he not in the same way or even approached her, he would have approached her as a different, a new conquest. I mean, it's only because of his words of Don Fernando's intervention there of being somebody important there that said, hey, look, there's something better for you. It's kind of like saying, hey, go take a look at this person. Because I'm sure he had seen other beautiful and virtuous women. He just hadn't noticed them. It's like walking by the roses and not even noticing them. So I, I thought that was, you know, a, a, an extremely important person, even more so than her. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, I mean, if we you know, we interpret in just science terms, like he, he's like, you know, like the, a John the Baptist type, right? Like go, go and meet this person. And then, um, we, we, which is an act of love, a virginal love, right? For Don Alphonse, uh, for sorry, Don uh, Fernando. And um, it's also interesting why uh, Miguel Manaro wanted to follow him, right? And I, I think the only, I mean, maybe, I'm, I mean, I think the way I read it is that it's the fact that he knew his father. So it, it, there's a reminder there, right? Like, I'm known by this man. I'm known by this man and that he wants to point me to something else. In other words, um, Don Fernando pointed him to a path, an, an educational path. Yeah. And, and to me, that's Cause, right. Because obviously, uh, Miguel knew there was something wrong in his life. There's all these women after women after women, and there's no satisfaction there. There's something missing. He had to know that whether he was acting that way or not before he met, ran into Don Fernando again. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Perhaps uh, I can make a brief comment, if that's okay. If you can hear me. Yeah, okay. So um, I really love the point where he actually mentions reality in his prayer in the fifth flat. He mentions punishment, humility, and that he desires a love for reality. It's kind of like a realiza realization where everything he Is it just, I think she's she cut off as uh, What? I, I, at least for my point of view, you, you, got, you got cut off. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, let me try changing my position. <laughs> Maybe that will work a bit better. Uh, so um, I mentioned that he, he has this prayer where he asks for the love of reality amongst other things. So I was reminded by that with your starting comments. And I really like that because it kind of shows that his previous behavior was like living in some sort of illusion. He knew he wasn't really uh, like grasping reality, truth in essence, right? As it fully is. And there's also one more thing I really loved, his character, like when his friends <laughs> describe him, they don't talk about only his clothes. They say he has a passionate eye, right? And I remember the Latin saying, I can't remember how to say it on Latin, but it's something like fortune rewards the brave, right? So I also think that God rewards the passionate. He's not like a sedated person where he's like, I don't care. You know, I'm dead. I don't care. I will not seek anything else. 
he's actually looking for a way out of boredom. And that's why he says at one point, I would rather live infinite lives, always starting over and starting over, if you remember that point from the play, because he did not know of anything better. Nothing better was shown to him until he, you know, was reached by Don Fernando and then uh, Girolama and so on. And there was also one thing I really loved. I just don't want to for forget to mention it. I don't know if we will get to it later, but the spirits, uh, I really found that interesting. Like when the spirit of heaven comes, it talks very simply. All the other spirits, they like talk for words and words and words. And <laughs> most of them say manara, manara, manara. Also the spirit of heaven does. But the last time I think the spirit of heaven calls him by his name, his first name. And I just think, you know, that was really cool. And it shows how love is actually very, very simple. And when you use truth, you really don't need much. So there, just that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I love the way he risked everything. I, I think that's that's great about Miguel Mayer. He risks a lot, right? He wasn't afraid of risking. Now, I did want to, sorry, did anybody want to talk? Sorry. I, I wanted to also read this um, again for also for those who haven't uh, read this. I think it's, this is my favorite line. This, for me, it's my favorite line because it's great. Um, so Don, um, so Miguel Manara uh, was told to go to see Girolama, this lady, um, and and then so so Miguel Manara goes and sees um, um, Girolama, and I'll just read you a couple passages. Um, Girolama says, I have no friends of my own age, Don Miguel, and so to tell the truth, I easily do without the company of girls of my own age. You see, I don't like either the way they laugh nor the way they cry, and sometimes they talk among themselves about men in a way I don't like to hear, to talk. I don't like to hear talk about men and the love of men. Yes, we lead a very retired life. In winter, I don't leave the house except to go to church, but in summer, we spend Sundays in the country. It is one hour from Seville. We have a house there with a big big garden, and I love flowers very, very much. Now, it's interesting because he will think this is like weird and boring, right? And one of the things that he um, complained about in the beginning was he's bored. I mean, it's very interesting how he says life is long, right? In the beginning of the play, he says life is long. Now, when is life long? Like, when, when do we have to drag our life until you know, wake up? Like, you know, like, like, you know, when you wake up and you're like, you hit your fourth alarm, it's like that, right? It's like, it's life is long when um, there's no meaning, right? But even in this this place, your llama, it seems like you would be bored, but she she wasn't. And then Don uh, Miguel Manara says, "You love flowers, and I don't see them in your hair or on your person. So if you love flowers, then why don't you have anything like any flowers on your hair?" Um, and this personally is my favorite line, um, lines. It's because I love flowers that I do not like girls who adorn themselves with them as with silk or lace or colorful feathers. I never put flowers in my hair. Flowers are beautiful living beings that we must let live and breathe the air of the sun and of the moon. I never pick flowers. We can very well love in this world where we are without wanting immediately to kill the one we love or to imprison it behind glass or as people do with birds, to lock them up in a cage in which water no longer tastes like water and summer seeds no longer taste like seeds. And it's for me, to me, that was what made me think, wow, this character is awesome, right? Um, we can very well love in this world where we are without wanting immediately to kill the one we love. And to me, I mean, 
In other words, it's not me. When I take when I take this flower and pull it out and put it on a vase or anything, I'm projecting an idea of this flower on the flower. But if I actually step back and just look at it, I can adore it better. It lives. It dies when I take it out. And to me, it's very much like you know what virginity is, according to Jusani. We we can only love the person or the thing in its truth. For example, I mean, Jusani always says, you can't, you know, if I love a person or I love a painting, I don't put my head on the painting, right? I can't see anything. I can only love within a distance. Um, and I would like to read this passage because I was reading it um, uh, the other day. Um, he says, virginity is for him. This is Jusani. Uh, this is, is it possible to live this way? Um, volume three for English, right? A sacrifice is needed, a sacrifice of what is immediate. Now for Jusani, the essence of sacrifice is beauty, right? The immediate is not true, so much so that it dies, it causes death. First, it makes things old, it stifles the tongue, brings, one struggles to stay on one's feet. It makes things die. The immediate makes things die. The immediate dies in your hands. In the morning, you're excited about your wife. In the evening, you tell her where to go. Tell her where to go means in the evening you kick her out. What is immediate binds and chains until one is strangled. This, the immediate strangles us. The strange phenomenon is detachment. To truly love a person, you need detachment. Does a man adore his woman more when he looks at her from one meter away in awe at the being he has before him, almost on his knees, even if he's standing? almost on his knees in front of her or when he takes her for himself? No, no, when he takes her for himself, it's over. Who possessed the Mag Magdalene, the prostitute more? Christ, who looked at her for an instant while she was passing in front of him or all the men who had possessed her? When a few days later, the woman washed his feet in tears, she answered the question. You can't establish a relationship with anything not with people, not with the flowers of the field, not with the stars in the sky, if not without a detachment within. If you don't detach yourself from the stars, you don't understand. If you gaze at a star without detachment, you wouldn't understand that it's a star within the infinity of stars. It's sacrifice that allows the unveiling of the truth of the thing or person that is present. So anyway, I mean, to me that was, um, um, what it, it just uh, re, uh, emphasized what uh, Jusani thought about what virginity is. I mean, to love a person is to detach oneself from that person, uh, which means also like, you know, if you're a father, right? We all, I mean, a father would have ideas for a son or daughter, right? But detachment means no, this son or daughter is not mine. This daughter or son is a gift. And the more I educate this person, to love his or her destiny, the more I love this person, right? So, so to love a person, according to Jusani, is to love his, the person's destiny. Not my ideas, but the person's destiny. And that's why I think for Jusani, I mean, it's a gift of this understanding of virginity to the whole church, because especially today, when we're talking about do priests, do we, do priests need to be married or not? They need to go to the root of the question, what does it mean to love in the love of Christ, the human love of Christ. And I think the virginal love of Christ, virginity, allows us to see only Christ is sufficient. We can only love the person when we love the giver, right? Anybody else? Where else? I'm gonna keep talking if you guys- Yeah, I, I was gonna uh, jump on that if I could. Uh, well, uh, I, I really liked myself most the scene where um, he enters the monastery and wants confession after she dies and the seeking penance. And it was interesting to me how the priest made him, you know, he wasn't interested in a grand expression of his feelings. He basically kept telling him to shut up a little bit, uh, calm down. This isn't going to happen. You both already got it. Love is here. Congratulations, you're forgiven. Um, and you can stop being dramatic about your sin now. 
also you're going to need to walk this road for forever but uh that was very intriguing or for, you know for the calmly like through the image was walking through graves um uh, or through trees, a line of trees. I don't have the text in front of me, so I'm going by memory here. But I, uh, I was intrigued by that because um, it was interesting to see him direct him away from what seems to me like taking the flower and put it in, putting it in his hair, you know, in that moment, and um, also really similar to the, the the painting you led with, with uh, Magdalene and Jesus in the garden, like, don't touch me, don't cling to me. Um, that he, and he kept saying, you're rushing, you're trying to have it all at once. You're, you're taking, right? Uh, I didn't fully, um, I liked the scene, but I didn't fully understand it. Um, but what we've been saying here has helped me to sort of get at it. And I'm curious how you see this uh, playing out with Jasani or in this play with um, the idea that um, somehow uh, an obsession with our sin and shame, desire to do something extraordinary final and in this instant where God is secured for it's this dramatic moment um, and, the, 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 and that desire to have it, to have God, but then the the creating of space between uh, that actually leads to holiness. Like, what's what's going on there? Um, the way I see it is this. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, first, he calls him father, right? Because he has an abs His father was absent, and the encounter with Girolama leads him to this man who he calls father. Um, and why is he a father, right? Because he tells him the truth. And now what Yusani says about penance is that it's really interesting because um, Miguel Manara was kept on saying, I did this, I'm horrible, I did this. Now, when he met Girolama, like, I mean, he experienced a love, like, you know, pretty much he was saying, do you know who I am? And Girolama said, kept on saying, yeah, I know you, I know you, I know you, right? Like, I mean, it's really interesting because um, when we do, when we commit a sin, we think we're defined by it, and we're always focusing and obsessed by it. And instead, when you receive a love, um, it, it even our sin has its place, right? And so, Jasani always said, um, when you ask for forgiveness, don't look at your sins first. You look at Christ. You fix your eyes on Christ on the cross, especially. When you fix your eyes on Christ, then you begin, especially on the cross, then you begin to see what sin really is. And there's sorrow there, but not scrupulosity, right? But sorrow. But sorrow because I could have loved you more. Like late have I loved you, right? St. Augustine's late have I loved you. Um, you know, he kept on saying, how can you read my heart in this way, Father? There's always a Yeah, and then um, the abbot, there was a place where, I, I don't know where it is now, but like where um, he says, here the stones are full of patience that waits and of a weight that listens. And listening is an act of love because it lets the other become part of you, right? And then the abbot says, love and haste do not agree, Manyara. It is by patience that love is measured. Life is long here. And he kept on saying, Life is long here. Um, now, patience, according to Jasani, means to carry everything, carry everything. And what makes it less burdensome is when one is in a relationship. Now, the opposite of patience, according to Jasani, is lukewarmness. It's not impatience, but laziness, lukewarmness for Jasani. Because patience means to understand that time is grace. So time, it's not like we can fix everything, right? I can't fix myself. So here, penance, it's really interesting because the abbot says, this is what we do in the monastery. This is the path, right? Now, now look, you, you keep on talking about your sins. And then he even says, they no longer exist, which is really, really a radical claim. They, longer, no, they no longer exist. You're forgiven. And then he says, look, there's a path here. You have to pray the morning prayer. You have to get work. I mean, he was showing him a path. It was always, in other words, 
I think when it comes to, um, you know, when he says life is long here, um, Miguel Manara could bear it now only because he's, he has met someone in his life, Girolama, that makes him see that life is good. And that it's really interesting because in that small space, right? I mean, Girolama says, here I have the house. And he, he names three things. There's the garden, beauty, her books, truth, and the poor, which is goodness, right? And then, and everything for him makes sense now. He can carry time. He sees time as grace because he's met something in his life. In other words, a presence in one's life gives one the certainty that the future is good, which is hope. And so it's an education to hope. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. I think, I mean, it's really interesting how time is long here in the big, in this, um, in the monastery is contrasted with in the beginning where he says, ah, life is long, right? It's no longer boring because life is boring when reality doesn't speak to me, right? When it does speak to me, it is more meaningful. Um, I don't know if that answered, I don't know. I tried to answer it somehow. I have a comment and question. I'm glad, um, there's, hi, this is Natalie. I'm from Houston, Texas. And um, thank you, Apollonio, for, for your talk. Um, I'm glad you said that because I was curious about the, um, yeah, the, the juxtaposition of that life is long before and then what you said in the monastery. Because specifically um, on page 72, and like I read this play a few times, but it's been a while, but I always wanted to understand this better where the abbot is telling him that, you know, maybe one day God will allow you to enter brutally like an ax into the flesh of the tree and to fall madly like a stone into the night of the water. And then it continues and it says, and then you will know what the flesh of the world is made. And so I was thinking about this flesh of the world. And then he concludes saying, and of a woman in love. So really, right, he will then, then know Girolama in the truest way. And so I wanted to ask you if this was like a correct interpretation, because I love what you said. I mean, you really helped explain that passage of, of Mary Magdalene and Christ to her that when he says, don't hold on to me, I never really got that. So that's helpful. But and I mean, it's connection to the Eucharist. So does that speak to this point here in the flesh of the world? Is that like what, what Father Jasani understands as, as virginity? And maybe here, if I know everyone is called to that, but if the monk is the epitome of that virginal love, so, you know, possession through extreme detachment, I, I don't know. These are just some thoughts that were coming up during the presentation. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, the way I read this passage is um, when Dusani speaks about freedom, I mean, he always speaks about mortification, right? I mean, freedom for him is the fulfillment of desire. It's not like the ability to choose right or wrong, right? But it's the fulfillment of desire. Um, and he, I mean, he, here it says life is long. Um, and then he speaks about how it's necessary that prayer be a fast before it's a banquet, a nakedness of heart before it's a mantle of heaven buzzing with worlds. Perhaps a day will come when God allows you to enter brutally like an ax, which is interesting because it says perhaps a day will come when God allows. In other words, he doesn't get to choose the time when he will affirm everything, the meaning of everything, to love everything the way he should. It's a gift. It's a grace. I mean, um, and that's really interesting. I mean, I think of it like, you know, like young people today, right? They always want like to get married really quickly or to know their vocation right away. Um, and then they can't wait because they don't know how to wait because they don't have hope, right? And so here, when a person lives in hope, um, you know that the future is good. How God will fulfill your desire is interesting. We don't know. That's the unknowing, the unknown part. It's a surprise. But a person with hope has the certainty that the future is good. How it will be, is that's Virginia where, you know, uh, to let God act, right? Not me, but to let God act. We always receive. And so I think for him is to say that this virginity, I do think that's what it means. I think this this means the virginal love of affirming the truth of everything. Being And to love is to be one with the thing, right? 
And so in some ways, you're one with the whole thing. Um, you will know what flesh the world is made, what is made out of. And for Jasani, what is the world made out of? It's the mystery. Um, and the more you embrace the mystery, the more you actually possess the world. Um, and so I think um, the, the way I see it is through sacrifice that you embrace everything. And, and, and life um, is filled with sacrifices. Um, and because again, I, sacrifice isn't for Jasani giving up something. Sacrifice for Jasani means affirming a presence, right? You affirm the presence of a thing is to recognize Christ. That's what sacrifice means. The one in front of me, Christ, is the meaning of everything. And in fact, it's really interesting because for him, you know, when, when you he says, when you receive the Eucharist, you might not be aware of what you're receiving, but at least at that moment say, you are the meaning of everything, right? So it's a step, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, I think. And, and so I think um, time is grace. It, it, it's, um, and, or, or to say in another word, love um, lasts through time, right? It, it, love is unfolded in time in the way God wants. And that's what virginity is, I think, to let love, uh, to receive this love that comes in time, through time. Hi, can I have a, I have a question? Uh, I'm, my name is Bob, I'm from Niceville, Florida. Uh, it seems like the desire, the detachment, love, love to the woman, all comes to the end, if I remember right, when he's, he's a beggar. And he's, he sees everything in this different way, the way, the way he, he's not only, he, he, he's, a, he's a beggar of beggars. I mean, he's, he's, reached, he's reached the point where he sees humanity in, in a very, very, the ax goes into the tree way, in a, in a sense. And, uh, but he, he's reached a new point in understanding uh, the, whole, the whole picture of the mystery. Could you talk about that a little? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, it's, it's really beautiful because in the end, um, n n people are not looking up to him because he's done many great things, right? He becomes a beggar with others, right? With the poor. Um, and to be a beggar is, is someone who is loyal to one's desire. Because if my desires are greater than what I can do, the most reasonable thing to do is to ask, is to beg for it that my desire be fulfilled. And again, I can't fulfill my desire. You can't fulfill my desire. And so what does this desire point to, right? Now, if, he, if you've met a presence in your life that has fulfilled your desire, who has fulfilled you, you ask again, uh, fulfill my desire today, right? So to beg is the most reasonable position that of a human being can, can have because it's, it's loyal to one's desire. Um, and of course, I mean, there's that, I don't know if you, there's that very beautiful line um, that Father Giussani said in front of John Paul II, right? That the real protagonist in history is the beggar, Christ who begs for man's heart and man who begs for Christ, right? And so I think in here, um, he's no longer bored because he's a beggar, because he knows the needs of his heart right? Because he knows the meaning of his needs and that there is an answer to these needs, he begs for more. And, uh, and I, th I think this is where um, somebody else in the beginning said this. Um, Don Alfonso was really, was Alfonso, I'll keep on, Fernando, was really interesting because he bet on his heart. And for Gisani, you can always trust the heart. You can always trust. Now, you can misinterpret the heart, but the heart, when you're loyal to it, which is to say, you're loyal to your experience, which is to understand the meaning of what's in front of me that provokes my desire, and you follow that, you verify it, it, it leads to begging. And I think it's really interesting because, especially today, when we think that the only way to be happy is to control things, to control everything, this technological understanding of the world where we have to create our own meaning, 
we have to create our political structures, change policies and laws and so on, that we don't get to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is religious. Um, you can't have justice without actually responding to the question of what will save what I love most? What will save my life? What will save the people that I love? And so for him, I mean, it's to beg is reasonable because it's to affirm that what we love is never lost. Right. I don't know, does that answer your question? Sorry, Bob, I mean, I went. Yes, thanks. Yeah, very good. Any other thoughts or comments before we wrap up for the evening? This has been really, really great. Thank you so much, Apollonio. But I'd love to hear if anyone has any final closing thoughts. By the way, for my former students and people from CL, St. Bernard's is a great school. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because I mean, I, you know, they have brilliant minds, beautiful hearts, and a great sense of humor. And and the, so even if you know, you know in college and you, you have to at least take one course from St. Bernard's, I think. I mean, it's, you know, even take an audit, like audit a class. I think it's great. I mean, and the people here are normal. Like it, they're not weird Catholics. They're actually normal and they love life. And, um, and the students are also great. So if you really wanna, you know, what it means to love the truth, beauty and goodness, it's a great place. It's a hidden treasure, I think. So anyway, that, that was just, if you read it carefully, it's actually written in the Miguel Magnara. Take at least a class at St. Bernard's. It's there. Uh, I just. Apoli uh, I. Oh, sorry. It's it's fine. Uh, Apollonio, how are we gonna? How? Who? What? This so, sorry, what was the I, I don't, what, what was the question? I don't know the, what the what just happened here. I, I just kind of got lost. Who's talking now or who's not? It's the you know blessings of Zoom conversations. So. I I just have a question, <laughs> Apollonio. The one of the last points you made in your introduction was about how reality doesn't betray us, and so I was wondering if you could just reference that in Miguel Manara. I mean, the way I read it, it's very simple that um, the story is more beautiful because um, that he was a womanizer in the beginning. Like, I, mean, I don't know how else I would conceive of him without him being a womanizer and then meeting somebody who struck him, who's exceptional. And then he goes through this purification of desire. He learns how to hope. He learns how to live time as grace. And he wouldn't be in a monastery without, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't want to make this like a logical thing where, I mean, it is true. Like if he wasn't, if he, 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 he went to the root of his problem, his sins, right? He was bored. He was loyal to it. And there's someone who sees that in a better way. And it was pointed to him, you know, go see Girolama. And this woman struck him. And it's really interesting because, you know, like he, it's, it's as if he, he always treated like Girolama as if like a little girl, like a little bird or something, right? Um, and yet this woman was very courageous and strong and she t taught him how to love truly. And, um, and because of this encounter, he went to the monastery and, and by the way, it's after she died, after she, even the death of Girolama has meaning because it led him to have more intimacy with Christ in the monastery. I mean, he wouldn't have gone to the monastery and become a beggar, uh, perform a miracle without the death of Girolama. Even death has meaning, right? So even the death of Girolama, 
Jiro Lama, even his sins has meaning. And it's, it's through the sin that Christ acts, right? I don't know if that's the answer. I would just uh, like to add, since the title of the conversation and everything was wounded by beauty, uh, I would just like to add, I was very reminded of it on page 15, the last claim by Don Miguel, what, what, that starts with silence. He talks about how Girolama penetrated him with his innocence and with her innocence. So um, that obviously is like a wound, right? So that is how it gets through us. It gets through skin and everything. And as for his perception of reality and how it does not betray us, I think that comes from greater perception of reality, like a perception of reality that is beyond the basic experiences people go through life. Like it is perceiving everything that is absolutely true and in that sense, real. He perceives God as real. So that is also part of the reality of things sense. Lama cries in the beginning. She says, I was so foolish for crying. It was a blessing, you know, she died with a pure heart and everything. So, as I said, I think that comes from, you know, his like kind of perception of, uh, of um, reality. And I really loved the, the entire text. It was very, very poetic and appropriate for this kind of interaction called Words with Wine. So I'm glad I had the opportunity to read it there. Yeah, can I just say something on silence? It's really interesting. There's a relationship between beauty and suffering, which is the response is always silence, right? And for Jusani, it's um, silence is another word for virginity because silence is when we see everything in its own light. And it's not that we go to have silence so that we can meet Christ. No, it's because we have met Christ that we are drawn to silence. And then we go deeper into what has happened in our lives. And contemplation is simply affirming, af embracing the depth of creation and God's action in history in our lives. Um, and so for me, yeah, that, I mean, it's really beautiful. Wounded by beauty means that there is this silence. It's another word for detachment, right? It's I want to affirm what has happened to me in my life and therefore um, affirm the meaning of everything. Um, I also, I forgot to say this, um, sorry. Uh, um, Brett Bertuccio's birthday is today. And I thank you for coming uh, on your birthday to um, here with us. Sorry, I just. <laughs> um, I didn't want to like make him embarrass him, but it was his birthday. And what did he, what could he have done in his birthday? He would come to, you know, words with wine, it's awesome. Yeah, happy, happy birthday, Brett. Everyone's putting that in the chat. <laughs> what a birthday party. Um, great. Any other, any other thoughts? This has been really wonderful. But I don't want to wrap it up if anyone has any closing thoughts that they wanted to share. No? Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. And it, 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 wonderful, wonderful um, evening. Our first words of the wine for the year. So I think this was a, a great kickoff um, to the series in 2021. Apollonio is a wonderful adjunct. We are so blessed to have him. And if you missed his course in the fall, um, we're hoping to have him again in an upcoming semester and also hopefully um, hoping to do some more content on Jasani. So if Apollonio and or the content of tonight or both um, intrigued you and you're looking for more, definitely be on the lookout for um, social media posts and emails from us about that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And thanks, Apollonio. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. She said one earlier. Yay, Apo! <laughs> Yo, good job, Apo. I'm glad all my notes helped you. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. You stole our lecture. Yay, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey. <laughs> That's awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye, Trisha. Big hug. Thanks. You too. <laughs>
Apple, I texted you a question, man. <laughs> Maddie, get on. <laughs> Did Apple leave? No, I'm still here. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm, I, was, I was thinking I should stay until everybody leaves. Yeah, well, your friends are left. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you're an Apo student, say hi. I think I'll Not a student, his friend. Good job, Apo. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go. <laughs> Why? Drink, finish your wine. Thank you guys. I already finished my wine. All Thank right. You. Good job. Bye.